just leave that one this. Okay, guys, so again, this is Isaac. I'm recording one of the kind of run throughs on one of the longer papers this time, um, the winter 2014 paper, paper code 970821. It's one of the longer papers. So, as before, what I'll do is go through some of the sources, uh, kind of highlighting and talking about some of the key information they're giving and things you want to look out for, and then kind of go through the questions one by one. Uh, we don't have time to go over everything. Uh, we'll focus on the first four questions, five questions, which are compulsory, and then kind of just quickly run through the different options you have for the later questions. Um, again, if you have any topics or want to go over specific questions, that's something for the live session that someone will be giving later this week. Um, so, yeah, so section A, so these are the extracts. So extract one is about Colombia losing ground in the coffee market. So we have here the information that Colombia was the second largest coffee producer in the world until the 1980s, and then you've got the positive aspects of coffee production, including kind of growth in incomes, uh, positive trade balances and employment. And then at the end of the 1980s, we obviously have the change. Um, between 1989 and 2011, it lost 7% of its share. Um, the kind of article suggested that was partly to Brazilian coffee producers increasing their exports and moving in. Uh, but then the article goes on to say that it's not just this increased international competition that causes the problem, but also uh, kind of other external factors. For example, the 2011 harvest being one of the smallest in 30 years because of environmental factors and issues of climate change, etc. Uh, extract two then contrasts kind of the Colombian coffee market with the Nepalese coffee market here in Nepal they is benefiting and having a, a burgeoning thriving coffee market. Um, Nepal's hills are kind of suitable for this growing coffee and it says that more people are doing it because of the export higher export prices. Equally, um, there's this kind of idea that uh, coffee consumption down here in paragraph three uh, is one of the kind of forecast to increase globally. People are consuming more coffee. And the pool is kind of stepping in in order to fulfill this demand. Um, and then the positive aspects of these exports are kind of this foreign reserves of the government and also kind of income for agricultural communities. Um, so the third source on this paper here, this table, is kind of giving you the average price of coffee. So within the market, what the prices are as we, as we move through from 2011 to 2012. Um, so moving on to the questions again, as I said before, the first five questions in this paper you have to answer uh, in full. Um, and that kind of the short mark question, then you have to do one of the essays uh, later on. So uh, question A is asking you kind of a data interpretation question, sim simple two mark question, asking you to describe the overall trend in coffee prices between 2007 and 2012. So basically this data here. And we've got to identify one year in which supply is likely to exceed the demand. Um, let's start with the first one. First part question, the overall trends. You can see that between 107 68 cents and one dollar seven cents in 2007 it's now 1.56 and that kind of implies that overall we've got this kind of upward trend in uh, the price of coffee so things tend to be moving in the upward direction and remember when you're looking at trend you're looking at where we started and where we finished and kind of the path taken and then we got to identify one year in which supply was likely to exceed the demand and in this case um when supply exceeds demand we're going to see the price price go uh, go down of coffee in order to kind of stimulate that demand. It's one of the results when you have a surplus. So we're looking for a year when the price went down. So here we can see that it's either in 2011, when it went from 2010 to, to um, sorry, 2012, sorry, when it went from 2010 in the year before 2011 to 156, or potentially you could also say 2009 when in the year before it went from 124 to 150. So either of those options would have been the right answer there. Um, question B is asking you to explain how coffee exports in a thriving tourism sector would contribute to the Nepal current count in the balance of payments. So you've got to think about the components of balance of payments. So here we know that both are going to have kind of positive contributions to the balance of payments because they're both exports. In one sense, you're exporting goods and services. So obviously that's going to be in the balance of goods or visibles. And then the tourism sector is obviously a services, but you're still exporting a service in tourism. So that's going to be kind of contributing to the services elements of the balance of payments or invisible to sort of um, Remember, those are two of the key components of exports within the balance of payments. It's that visible and invisible distinction. And kind of highlighting both those and giving an explanation there would, would get you the four marks. Um, referencing here, extract here, just check we're still recording. I had an issue with that on a previous situation. Yep, still good. 
question C here, uh, here wants us to reference extract two. So we have to classify coffee using concepts of income elasticity, right? So in that case, let's go to extract two. And here we've got um, this, it's going to be in this, this paragraph here. So coffee consumption is forecast to increase globally by about 3% over the next decade, as it did over the past decade. That's because of rising incomes. So from that, we can thereby interpret that coffee is a normal good in the sense that as it becomes rising, demand for that good is increasing. Therefore, as it sits here, we've got a positive elasticity of demand, income elasticity of demand, and therefore it's a normal good. Make sure you're quoting the extract or referencing where you get that information from the UMP and for that from the extract. Okay, question to you. We're moving nicely through these quite basic, simple questions at the beginning. No reason you shouldn't be getting top marks on here. So slightly trickier, six marks. Using diagrams, we're going to explain how to do this into the supply of affecting the coffee market in Colombia and in Nepal. So first, let's address Colombia. And the extract has talked about how Colombia has kind of fallen supply of the coffee market to losing its market share. Uh, and therefore, we're simply going to draw a supply and demand diagram, very basic to two curves. And we're going to show a shift to the left of supply, forward supply. And technically, we can also infer this is kind of a high level if you want to do we've got this increased competition, which is suggest, perhaps suggests a falling demand for Colombia's coffee, Burka coffee as well. But mainly, we've been focusing on this kind of shift left. We've seen that environmental factors and increasing international competition means Colombia's supply much less of the, the world coffee. Uh, we can say if we're specific the Colombian coffee market, it's advanced 42. So getting that analysis, kind of drawing the diagram and showing the shift and explaining it, that's going to get you three marks. We now turn off to the second country here, in this case, Nepal. I'm going to say that Nepal has kind of increased demand. Uh, this is kind of right shift uh, of the demand curve, simply because uh, Nepal is experiencing greater demand for coffee. It says here in the extract, you can often reference the extract. Um, where was it? It was. More, most Nepalese coffee is ex exported. Um, rising incomes, demand, increasing demand for the coffee, encourage kind of coffee drinking countries such as China. And here also we have this important part here about Nepal by saying that they're producing 30 times the crop more in the early 1990s and 60% more lands being used for coffee and production is increased by 20%. So we clearly are seeing that there's an increase in supply there. So when we're drawing the diagram, we're going to want to show both those patterns. So again, using the using the extract and the extract explicitly mentions what's going on in supply and demand uh, dynamics in both Colombia and the pool in order to transfer this question. Remember, very simple use of diagram. Make sure when you're using diagrams, you're referencing diagrams. So you say, as you can see on my diagram, supply has shifted from S1 to S2 or something like that. So really getting explicit in our analysis is quite the important here. Okay, finally on this first section, quite a simple first section in this case, really nice that we get this kind of good extracts and good questions. We discussed the view that Nepal should specialise in the production of coffee and Colombia should specialise in some other product given the changes in cost that have occurred. So as we've heard that Colombia is having to kind of spend more on producing coffee because of uncertainty of weather, etc., and global warming, and Nepal is having a very successful coffee kind of burden so, um, of the industry. So first we want to talk about kind of this specialization concept. And here we want to really discuss this based on the law of comparative advantage. So the law that each country should specialize in the good which has comparative advantage, essentially that good at which has the lowest opportunity cost. So opportunity cost is a crucial, crucial uh, notion here. And we know that the opportunity cost has fallen in Nepal as the pool is becoming more efficient to produce coffee and having a coffee industry. And it's risen in Colombia. Colombia has had like a contraction of coffee. So, in theory, the law of comparative advantage based opportunity cost different would also suggest that we should shift production to the pool, specialize. However, there are some evaluation there, we're going to need to do that in the So, that first part of the analysis is important because of the law of comparative advantage, depending on what that is as a result, with reference to opportunity cost, and then showing how the costs are falling in the pool in Britain and Colombia, then we're going to use that to demonstrate that we should shift the production to the pool and specialize. However, we also want to have some evaluation and a possible evaluation that I've used here is that Colombia is historically more expert and established. So maybe in the long run, we do want Colombia to stay um, as an exporter. Maybe Colombian coffee has some like, differentials with the Nepalese coffee. It's maybe of a higher quality, of better taste, of different taste. So maybe we should suggest that there, that there shouldn't be some specialization there. OK, uh, overall, key things to take out. Use the sources. They're really important. 
on this on this part of the part of the exam and really make sure if you're using diagrams you're referencing them but that was a fairly straightforward part one in my opinion as why it didn't take very long to go through so moving on to question two here we're going to uh, use supply and demand diagrams in question 2a you'll remember only answer one question from this section uh, using the supply and demand diagram, I'm going to explain how the imposition of a subsidy on a good would affect the surplus enjoyed by the producer. That could, again, really easy diagrammatic analysis of uh, supply and demand. Well, first, what is a subsidy? So, subsidy is where the government uh, gives money to producers uh, in order to encourage them to produce more. So, the way a subsidy works is it shifts supply to the right since the uh, consumer can now, or the producer, sorry, can now produce as much more than they were uh, previously, with their given input, simply because the government steps in and boosted, boosted the, the level they could supply. Uh, so once we've just supplied to the right, you also want to highlight the size of the subsidy. Sorry, that should be size plus six. Um, let's just edit that. Size of the subsidy, uh, and that's the vertical distance shift. So the bigger the subsidy, the bigger it's going to be. And then you just want to show how this impacts on consumer surplus. We're using a diagram. We know the consumer surplus is the area between the price point and the uh, supply curve. And we're going to say that it increases it. So when you increase, um, let's just check my screen is still recording and sharing. Yep, we're still good. So when you, um, sorry, when you increase, uh, shift supply to the right and increase kind of your subsidy, um, uh, you're going to have an increase in consumer surplus. It's a positive thing for, for uh, supplies. Pretty simple analysis there. Right now, this is slightly more complicated. Here, we're talking minimum price legislation or the imposition of indirect tax is more effective in improving resource allocation than the consumption of good causing negative externalities. Well, the question here is, what's a negative externality? Well, we probably want to define that. We want to say it's a negative uh, cost that's incurred, probably a social cost. It's incurred uh, on individuals outside the economic exchange. It's that take into account in normal supply and demand models, as an example of market failure. And therefore, we're going to want to, people are, are producing too much, we want to shift the production, we want to disincentivize people from consuming and producing too much. So how are we going to do that? Here, they're giving us two options. One is this minimum price legislation, where the government sets uh, a price below, sorry, above market, so above market price, that must be transferred to the as a result. Um, individual obviously are going to want to want less of that. The other one is putting a tax, so an indirect tax, or some tax on consumption. So any individual who produces the human consumes is going to have to pay a tax or the producer is going to have to pay a tax for every unit consumed. And therefore the price is going to increase. So both of those two incentivize falls in uh, quantity within the market of the good that's causing the negative externality. So having explained how both those work, um, we really want to talk about kind of the, the relative benefits and issues between them. So with regard to a tax, uh, the biggest issue is setting the right tax rate. For example, it's very difficult often to, to kind of work out the monetary value of a negative externality. Uh, those are often very difficult to measure, and therefore we're really concerned with making sure that we set the, the size of the tax relative uh, to the uh, size of the externality. So we can entirely internalize the externality. If you set it too low, you're not going to get much of the externality, and people are still going to still going to buy. It's still going to be negative impact. It's too high. It's going to be too harsh, and you might start eating into some positive aspects of of, of the consumption and production. What's another kind of issue with taxes is you've got to have collect it and enforce it. For example, if you do like toll roads, you have to have expensive infrastructure, such as like the IT systems. A good example is London's congestion charge. It costs a lot every year to implement. You've got to have cameras assessing who goes in and out, and enforcement mechanisms. So that's quite important. Especially also the third analysis, and this is probably the strongest, is increases of analysis. So when you have things like petrol, for example, which is essential, if you tax petrol, people still need fuel. Right. People need fuel to part, use their cars. It's an essential. There's no kind of substitutes there. So because you have very inelastic demand, raising prices is going to have an effect. So in case of necessities, we don't probably want to use the tax. We also talk about redistribution effects that indirect taxes are aggressive and affect low income uh, households more. And they also might cause inflation. Uh, there's various issues here. Uh, there's like multiple, multiple things you could talk about. Moving on to the opposite, which is uh, the other option here, which is this minimum price. It's quite simple to draw back a minimum price again. We have the same issue of tax. Where do you put the minimum price estimation of size of the externality? It's often very difficult. Um, but the main problem we have with the minimum price is it creates a surplus. Um, that uh, when you raise prices above the market equilibrium, supply is going to uh, 
uh, outstrip demand, you're going to have a surplus, and often this can be problematic uh, for suppliers, producers of goods for whom this is their livelihood. You really want to take into account the impact this has on uh, consumers. Uh, on, on producers, sorry. But often we can say that with the minimum price, and this is why I would conclude, because again, you want to have a conclusion when you have a, you have a discussion question, would be to say often these are more accurate, so probably more effective at, at, um, at internalizing the externality in its entirety. Perfect. So question 3A. Here, question. Let's just see how we're doing with the recording. Yep, still recording. So sorry, I'm just a bit paranoid that I keep using recordings at the moment halfway through, so I keep checking. Okay, question 3A. So here we've got to explain the factors that determine whether price elasticity of demand for products has a high value or a low value. Well, the first thing to talk about is what do we mean by high value or low value? Well, when you, we say high value, it's when obviously the new number's high, and that means we have elastic demand. And then with low value means an elastic. So defining what price elasticity of demand is, and explaining it, and explaining what we mean by high value and low value is the first part of the question. And then we've got to think of the factors. These factors, I can give you a list and we'll talk a little bit about them. We'll talk about things like availability of substitutes. So can you use another product instead? Uh, is it got a kind of subsidiary demand in order for itself or for its use as a kind of in, uh, input in production? Is there is it necessity for something you need, or, or is it something that you can kind of go without? All these factors are really going to impact whether it's got inelastic or, or elastic demand. Um, they're all important to kind of think about. Here, uh, then on question two, this is where kind of it becomes important to, to do proper analysis. Uh, we're talking about uh, question 3B, so discuss whether it is both possible and beneficial for a business to change the price elasticity of demand for its product. So first we want to talk about why businesses might want to. So is it is it beneficial? And then we're going to talk about is it possible? Uh, and that's how we're going to kind of evaluate this question. And then we want to think about whether evaluate both and decide whether they should do it or not. So why should business change it? Well, if they might, a lower price elasticity of demand, uh, if they suggest that we can lower it, so make the demand more inelastic, then we can raise prices in order to increase sales revenue. So if you increase prices when demand is inelastic, then demand isn't as responsive and you get a boost in sales revenue and therefore more profits. Uh, with a higher price of elasticity of demand, businesses might cut, price, cut prices. Um, so if you want to boost your, make it more elastic, then cutting prices is going to massively boost your, your demand and therefore going to increase sales revenue by a large percentage. So it's really clear that being able to move your um change the price elasticity of demand in either direction, either to more elastic or inelastic, is going to determine your your the way you act in terms of price. Um, and therefore, it's going to be uh, important to kind of establish which way it's going. But if you can move to the extremities, then you can definitely benefit from that by changing prices in a way that stimulates demand, or in some cases doesn't stimulate demand if you're raising the prices for elastic products and then gain your more revenues and raise profits. What we want to also think about is this is in, obviously going to be entirely dependent on the nature of the industry. It's a very competitive industry there. You might say, well, it's not that beneficial because if you move your prices, it's not about whether they're kind of demanded in themselves or what if other people want to cut you, et cetera, et cetera. So you've got to think about the industry-wide implications as well here, not just businesses in isolation. The second part of the question is, could they do it? And um, whether it's possible and the price of the demand can be changed, and the, probably the easiest way and most common way to do this is advertising. And advertising includes things like promotions, includes things like uh, probably more more likely advertising campaigns on televisions, encouraging people to buy the product, make them feel a necessity, uh, and make them feel like they are kind of um, your product, which is of superior quality and of essential needs, and then that's going to increase the make the demand more elastic. To make it more elastic, what you might do is you might suggest something like a promotional campaign that highlights the fact that you you might be having a sale coming up. Uh, you might try and get your name out there so that people know about your product, so that when you do lower prices, you get this massive boost in demand. And it's like very elastic. You show it's kind of a luxury product. People might want to buy. The price goes down, etc. Um, is it possible to do so well? Um, we want to, we can, well, I'm sorry, let's just go through some other things. So you've got advertising, and it makes them more or less sensitive to product. You could, you could also 
have explanations based on moving substitutes. You can price other people out of the market, your competitors, and therefore your demand is more inelastic as a business, perhaps. But there's a fault with kind of like difficulty over business regulation, etc. It's also on valuation and whether it's possible. Well, firstly, is advertising effective? Well, sometimes, sometimes not. You have to spend a lot of money to advertise. Um, and we also want to think about the proportion of income spent on the product. So are people really spending much of their income on the product? And can we change that rather than simply changing the elasticity? Can we make them more likely to spend more of their income? Is that more effective to advertising rather than changing elasticity? Um, and again, the evaluation that removing kind of competitors from the market or removal of substitutes is kind of like often frowned upon or is in many cases actually illegal and can be quite difficult. It's certainly against anti-competitive competition law in many European countries. So again, fraud with difficulty. That's an evaluation point there. So question 4A. Sorry. So question 4A, let's just check the time. How are we doing? Did not want to do that. Okay, 10 minutes left. I'm really ahead of time. It's been a very quick paper. It's not a particularly complicated paper. So explaining how tariffs and an undervalued exchange rate can operate to protect the domestic market from foreign competition. So first things first, what's a tariff? Well, a tariff is a simply a tax on imports. So whenever someone brings something into a country, you charge them either a percentage of the cost of the product or the value of the product or a flat rate for bringing the product. So you're basically raising the, raising the price of imports. So firstly, how does tariffs operate to protect the domestic market? Well, domestic market, therefore, if you have tariffs, it's less threatened by international competition. Foreign goods are more expensive. And particularly, we're talking about, in this regard, um, we're talking about protecting like domestic domestic industries because their prices are likely to be lower than those in tariff. For example, let's say you've got people in the UK producing tennis balls and their tennis balls cost a pound. But America is producing tennis balls at 50, 50 pence. But if you charge a tariff as a pound on tennis balls, American tennis balls being sold in the UK now cost a pound 50 because the tariff on bringing them in. And therefore, you can see that although the American tennis balls would be more competitive and without tariffs, the tariffs therefore kind of change the, change the market dynamic and change the competition. Uh, on the other side, the undervalued exchange rate um, operates in a way that when you have an undervalued exchange rate, you kind of obviously raise the cost of imports. Imports are much more expensive if your exchange rate is undervalued. You can buy less foreign currency with your currency, but it also means that foreigners can buy more of your currency than their currency. So it's re- raising the cost of the imports while reducing the cost of exports. Obviously, that's going to protect um, foreign uh, domestic companies sorry, from foreign competition, but it's also going to increase their, their exports and their, them selling their products. So they're likely to have greater revenues and therefore greater profits. And obviously, that's going to kind of protect protect um, the domestic market from foreign competition. So highlighting those two factors is going to be really important there. Right, question 4B. Here it's asking us to discuss whether protectionism disadvantages most people in the protected country. So protectionism is these two things up here, tariffs and undervalued exchange rate are the two kind of most common mechanisms used in what's called protectionist trade policy, where a country is trying to protect its own industries from foreign competition on the international markets. So what are some of the advantages of protectionism? Well, the advantages are that we safeguard vulnerable industries. So, for example, if the UK car, car industry is being threatened from cars from Japan or Korea and shop like Toyota here, we're going to protect our domestic industry to make sure they can survive. What are the advantages of that? Um, well, you've got jobs mostly, so we're saying keeping jobs in countries, etc. Um, often it's used professionalism to protect infant industries, so we're talking about industries that aren't necessarily competitive yet. They've just been started up. You've got like an emerging pharmaceutical industry, maybe, but you're scared that established business pharmaceutical industries from around the world are going to just come in and sell their better products on the or cheaper products on the uh, domestic markets, and that's going to mean that your industry can never even get competitive and get off the ground. So we might want to protect those using protectionism. That's obviously good for the owners of the businesses, the people they're employing, and the country itself, because in the long run they might have cheaper products once that industry gets off the ground. The other one is to prevent dumping. Well, dumping is a practice where countries with surpluses just go and sell their products really low in other countries. So often it's the case that in a great example is the European Union farming, where we have a lot of surplus agricultural products, and we just go and sell them in Africa for nothing. And we go and sell them for really cheap. And that means that African farmers aren't getting any money 
and they're not being able to use it as much. And they're struggling to earn income. So if you're a country and you want to stop people coming in, and other countries coming in and dumping their products on you, then you might engage in protectionism, stop them doing that. So those are the kind of advantages there. So we talk about things to kind of the employed population that we don't know. We have low unemployment. You're keeping people in jobs. And also the owners of those businesses. And also in the industry argument, we're talking about country benefits from having this industry being developed in the long run. What are the disadvantages? Well, the kind of first good advantage is when you have protectionism, you're distorting kind of free markets from trade, and therefore you're losing the case of the comparative advantage. If you're protecting the industry, you're meaning the countries that have comparative advantage can't come in and challenge you. So you're basically stopping that avenue from working. Other factors that kind of have disadvantages are things like higher prices for consumers. Obviously, if you impose a tariff or keep your currency undervalued, imports are more expensive. So consumers who are having to import or companies that are having to import like kind of components for their products, etc., or machines are having to pay a lot more. So it's not really they've got they've got to face higher prices. Also say that they have less choice. If you have only one choice because you're stopping kind of foreign companies coming in and bringing in their products, there's less competition, less choice for consumers. They can't choose between English televisions and kind of Korean televisions or Japanese televisions. They can only choose English televisions, so they have obviously less choice because it's, they can't. Other people can't get in. They can't afford to import the tariff. But the prices are too high if they do, so they just don't sell it anymore. And the final kind of criticism is that. Sometimes in the infant industry arguments, maybe there's a case to protect them because they're growing and they need to be protected at the beginning so that then they can become efficient. If you have a business that's basically stuck in its old ways, it's not really advanced, there's not enough R&D and it's not keeping up internationally, then maybe it isn't efficient. And it's right to kind of let it fail and let it die and kind of develop and move on and find a new industry. And if you engage in protectionism, well, then you're keeping those kind of inefficient businesses alive. And perhaps that's not so beneficial for those businesses, those sectors and the country as a whole. Uh, other advantages, actually, that we should talk about for protectionism is that it increases tax revenue for the government, especially tariffs, uh, and they can then spend that money on goods and services. Um, so those are kind of the, the run-throughs of all those questions. Um, it's actually quite a simple paper, in my opinion. Uh, there shouldn't be too many questions there, but again, if there are, uh, do let us know, uh, either via the Slack or by uh, talking to us in the live session later this week. Uh, have a good evening. Hope that was useful.